Um, so the purpose of the talk today uh, is to talk about bug bounty programs, what's going on, give you a little bit of education, and then talk about the various types and what's happening. There's a lot that's going on out there. Um, there are some people, if you saw hands that went up that are doing this stuff, use them as resources. Uh, there's some folks that run bug bounty programs in this uh, room. Uh, so definitely uh, spend time with them as well. Uh, my name's Jake Coons. I'm the CISO for a company called Risk Based Security. This is Karsten Iram. He's the chief research officer. He's done a, a bunch of bug bounty stuff. So uh, with that, we're going to get rolling. Um, the reason we got into this stuff is that we actually do a lot of vulnerability intelligence. So we've been tracking for a while what's going on with disclosures and what's happening, and how is money influencing what's going on in research. So um, that's what leads us to here today. All right, so information security, career decisions. Um, I would imagine most of you are already somehow in the security world doing some kind of work or you're here because you want to learn and you know, work your way into a security role somewhere, right? Um, and there's lots of choices, right? And I think you've been hearing over and over that it's really hard to be an IT generalist these days and even, even worse, right, an IT uh, security generalist. You can, you can do it, but everything's getting so specialized that you sort of have to pick, pick a role, right? And so, you know, we go out there and we look and you see all these words like analyst and auditor and uh, specialist and all this other stuff, doing some searches um, on some job hunting sites. It's funny, our favorite one was the cybersecurity hunter as a title. We thought that was pretty amusing. Does anyone have that as a title? <laughs> no? All right. You want, you're working on it. Was that what it was? All right. So, but what it comes down to typically, and I hate to sort of generalize it this much, but it's sort of, you're presented with two pills, right? It's the blue pill or the red pill. How many blue pill people are in the room? A ah, couple. And a lot of people seem to be undecided on what you're going to take, right? Um, but when it comes down to it, most people say the red pill is the way to go, right? Um, and almost everyone seems to be talking about offense and that's what's sexy, etc. cetera. Um, blue teamers, Team to, seem to be really uptight these days, right? Um, if, if, you, if it feels like there's too much red team attention going on, the blue, the blue team guys feel very uh, sort of, you know, taking it back, right? Like it's not, it's not fair to them. And I can say that because I started my career as a firewall guy, so I was a, a blue team guy for a long time. Um, so why do people like red teams, right? There's a lot of reasons, and, and typically these are, these are some of the ones that come back, right? Constant learning opportunities. You get to play and break things. I mean, how cool is that, right? That's what you're paid to do. And you're generally well paid to do this. Um, and even sometimes you get to mess around with social en engineering stuff, which some people in the room really enjoy, and, and it can lead to a lot of other fun things trying out, right? And then at the end, there's nothing better than popping a box, getting root, something about winning, right? It just feels great, and, and people love that. Um, when you say red teaming, it could be sort of broader, but people typically think of that as uh, pen testing, right? Um, and it seems like everywhere you go and you talk to vendor or security vendors and companies, everyone's looking for pen testers right now. Um, but actually, when you go out on a, a job search board like Indeed, you do a search for pen testing and only sort of 17 come up. Uh, you know, jobs that are open, if you will, but it does feel like everyone's looking for some type of pen tester these days. Um, when you're a pen tester, there can be some things that are pretty painful, right? So there's a lot of fun, but there's also some things that go along with it that maybe aren't so great. And a few things are you're usually working at some sort of company and you're dealing with some sort of political politics, those sorts of things, which is no fun, right? Uh, you have to test during specific hours. Many of those times can be sort of uh, when you do want to be sleeping or drinking or doing something else later at night, weekends, etc. cetera. Um, you end up having to write these really, really long reports that you know no one's going to read or even understand. Uh, but you have to make it really, really long because it's got to see like it's valuable, right? Because if it's a short report, why would the customer pay all that money for this short report? So get in there and write some stuff, right? Um, and then you do have to deal with these things called clients, right? Right? So statement of works or present those findings, conference calls, et cetera. And those are things that, that just aren't as fun, right? Um, so there's also an option of being an uh, independent pen tester. Um, it means you don't have to work for the man, but there's still a, a breakdown, right? And that breakdown is roughly, we'll say, a third of it, it's the fun part, you know, breaking and doing stuff. Then you get another third of it's the administrative tasks and documentation. And then that last bit, 
being a sales weasel, right? Like you're going to have to find work. It just doesn't show up at your door and go, oh, I, I'm so happy. Could you do this pen test for us, right? It's just not going to happen that way. So there's got to be sort of a better career choice potentially, right? Maybe a bit more of a tasty decision. And we, th we think that there might be, right? And you could be this guy, right? <laughs> you like this? The, the quick pepper sprayer guy, right? So you could be dog or what I say is better yet, you could be this guy. Um, and hopefully in, that, in this sort of lineup of, of going down the bug bounty hunter route, you know, you're 90% hopefully of your time researching uh, vulnerabilities and whatnot, and then maybe that little bit less time, 10% or so, is working uh, on the write-ups and a lot of other stuff. All right. So with that, I'm going to have Karsten do a quick overview of just sort of to set the bounty stage for you guys. So one of the first things we want to cover is a bit of re re research and motivation back in the old days before we had all these bug bounties. Um, back then we were reporting vulnerabilities to the vendors because uh, it looked good on our resumes and it got us credit in vendor advisories. If you didn't have a job or you wanted to get into this sort of business, it was a good way to actually get a job and potentially for one of these companies that you found vulnerabilities in. Um, if you already had a job, it could obviously lead to higher salaries or better jobs. So why we like to go around saying that, oh, back in the old school days, we were so altruistic. We, let's be honest, there was absolutely nothing altruistic about it. Uh, it looked good for us and it worked out nicely. The problem was that uh, it wasn't hassle-free. Uh, reporting vulnerabilities to vendors was often very painful. Um, often they didn't respond. If you did get a response, they were often a legal threat. So a lot of researchers just said, you know what, fuck it, let's find some alternatives. So what a lot of researchers did, they uh, published it just somewhere else, like we just dropped it on a mailing list. Uh, we would trade, give it away within groups for respect and goodwill. We would use it offensively for fun or, and or profit. Or we would just kind of say, yeah, I found this, fuck it, store it in a digital box somewhere, move on. Or there was this other option, because we did have monetary options back then also. There was the gray market three and four letter agencies, and we also had the black market. So we had these options if this was something we wanted to do. So some of the vendors and, uh, and security companies kind of realized that, hey, you know what, if we start rewarding discoveries, we can actually incentivize researchers to come to us and report their vulnerabilities to us. Uh, in 2002, iDefense created their vulnerability coordination program, where research could come to them sell their vulnerability findings to them, they would coordinate, they would provide the information to their customers, make a business model out of it that way. Uh, in 2004, Mozilla created their bug bounty program where they were paying 500 bucks for critical vulnerabilities. So, we want to do a bit quick pop quiz though. In what year was the first bug bounty program started? Because a lot of people consider this to be something pretty new. Yeah, you can answer it most likely, but anyone else just yell out any years? No, no? 90? 1995. 1995, exactly. And then you also know who did it? Netscape. Netscape, exactly. So in October uh, 1995, Netscape actually launched the first bug bounty program where they were paying money. And what is very interesting about that program was the fact that they went out and said, we don't want to pay people to find vulnerabilities in our stable products. We want to incentivize researchers to find vulnerabilities in our beta products so before they go stable, does that remind you of any other companies that just did a bug bounty program recently? Microsoft actually did this recently, and people have been talking about, oh, that's a new way of doing it, but actually someone was doing it 20 years ago. So through 2000 to 2008, disclosure was this huge battleground between vendors and researchers. Researchers had problems getting vendors to respond and take it seriously and getting them to understand the issues. And the perception was, whether it was true or not, that uh, vendors didn't take vulnerabilities and security seriously unless we dropped it on a mailing list. And we like to say that researchers back then were hardcore full disclosure the quote-unquote right way. I mean, the focus was on getting bugs fixed, right? And that's, why, that would, that's what they were focusing a lot on. Then in 2007, we saw the first kind of bug bounty competition, uh, the Pwn to Own, where in two, you could win MacBook Pros, and ZDI was offering up 10,000 US dollars also in bounties. And that competition has then grown in 2010. There was suddenly 100,000K on the line. 
And this competition grows every single year. They definitely set the bar high for being able to win this money. But if you can do this, there's a ton of money in it. There's a ton of PR. In March 2009, we also saw some researching, researchers coming out in big more and say, you know what? We have this new philosophy. No more free bucks. We want to get paid for our work. It's valuable. We want to get paid. To be honest, we don't really know how much effect it had. Um, but it definitely sparked a debate. And it also made it very, very clear to vendors what at least many research expectations were that we wanted to get compensated for the work that we were doing. So and that leads us to present day, where bug bounties are now all the rage, like everyone's doing it, and the ones that are not doing it kind of want to do it because it looks good, and it's getting a lot of attention. And now we're seeing all these different types of bounty programs also. We're seeing what we call company-run bug bounties. We see third-party bug bounties. We see these competitions, as mentioned, crowdsourced bug programs, which are all things that we'll be covering next. And we're also seeing different types of rewards. We're seeing cash, prizes like T-shirt, get a mug, get some conference attendee, attendance, fame and glory appreciation. But I mean, if we want to do this as a career choice and not just be hobby hunters, cash is king, right? End of day, getting a mug, getting a T-shirt, that's nice for the hobby hunters, but we want money, right? So that's what we want to focus on. So by that, Jake will now discuss company-run bug bounties. All right. Um, so, so our definitions, this is what we believe these are. So we're calling it company-run bug bounty. Basically, it's the uh, bounties being run by the company that owns the website that you'd be going after or the software, right? Um, and in almost all cases, um, reporting and coordination and all that sort of stuff is directly with the company and not through some sort of intermediary, right? Uh, the process is simple. You discover a vulnerability. You send the details to the vendor or some list if they have information on the website of what it is. Hopefully, the vendor uh, can reproduce it, and then they'll accept your submissions and, and you get paid, right? Um, the number of bug bounty programs just continues to grow, right? Every time we, we turn around, we're finding more and more that pop up. We maintain a list of, of bug bounty programs as we map the vulnerabilities that we're discovering. Um, just to give you a little bit of sort of understanding what's going on, there's around 300 or so programs. Uh, 260 of those have some type of reward. About 165 provide some sort of recognition. And about 75 per, uh, of those have some sort of monetary reward. Um, Bug Crowd has a really, really nice um, uh, crowdsourced list publicly. You can go to their site and check it out and, and look for some of the ones if you want some more details. Um, can't really talk about uh, bounties without talking about Google, right? Uh, Google started providing bounties in 2010. They con uh, continue to be one of the more serious uh, players when it comes to the bounty space. Uh, we believe they're a big reason that uh, bounties took off, Ponium 4 with 2.7 million in prizes. Um, August 2013, uh, Google had paid out a little bit more than $2 million, rewards for over 2,000 valid reports. So some pretty serious, pretty serious money. Um, they also uh, took things a bit further as well and started saying, hey, we're also not just going to pay for things in our software, but we'll pay for, for Volms and other software as well, right? Um, and they really just continue to push for um, fixing Volms, disclosing them in a timely manner, fixing them in a timely manner, all these, uh, these sorts of things. So. Uh, they've been a serious player. Now I want to talk a little bit about Facebook. Um, so Facebook was, uh, their bounty program was founded in 2011. Um, they have over 1,500 uh, bounties that have been paid uh, to date. About 600 unique researchers um, were paid. And they've paid researchers in 79 countries. Uh, with the top countries being India, the USA, and the UK. And their whole premise, again, is to uh, find issues that can help make um, you know, Facebook a more secure uh, platform, right? A um, couple interesting bits. Their average uh, bounty is in the low thousands. Um, they have a minimum of $500 that they pay for a bounty, and they don't have a maximum set, uh, so it just all depends. And the largest bounty that they have paid out was a, a little more than $33,000. So, um, so you can get a pretty substantial payment from those guys. And they have more details on that, that vulnerability on their website, and you can find out more details of, about the program. Um, so pretty interesting to see there. Um, What's also interesting is they did, uh, they provided us some information 
Um, we actually sent out questionnaires to a bunch of vendors asking for feedback as well. Uh, they provided us some information also. They blogged about it. Um, they paid out more than uh, $1.5 million in bounty rewards in 2013, so you're talking about a fair amount of money. Um, and so that was, that was really interesting. But a couple other things that popped up that were really eye-opening. Um, they received close to 15,000 bug submissions in 2013. That is a huge number, right? Um, and they said it was a 246% increase in one year of the, the number of vulns that were submitted to them. But what's really, really eye-opening is that only 687 were actually deemed valid and received some sort of financial compensation, right? So for you that it's really early or you're not great with math, that's not a high number, right? It's not great. Um, and so you want to make sure that uh, if you're trying to do this for money that you're one of the ones in that range, right? So whether it's following their rules, which we've seen problems with, right? They have some things where it says don't attack live profiles and then people do and they still expect they're going to get paid and you're not going to, right? Follow the rules, get some stuff clear to them. You want to get in there so that you're one of the ones getting paid and not one of the ones that's uh, getting nothing or a t-shirt. Um, we did mention that the list continues to grow, and that's very true, but there are some, there are lots of uh, vendors out there that you would expect that would have bounty programs and do not. There's a, there's a lot of holdouts, so still room for a lot of growth here. Um, so again, if you're trying to make this a, a career, it seems like more and more companies are going that path, and we expect to see more coming. All right, um, so now we're going to talk about what we call third-party bounties. Um, and just to sort of set the stage for this, this is bounties um, that are run by other companies that do not own the software. And typically, um, they're just looking for software things. They're not talking about website or what we also call site-specific vulnerabilities, okay? Um, and the reason they do this, right, is they use this information, right? They buy up uh, information to either provide to their customers as an alerting service or they build it into their products, right, so that their products are finding vulnerabilities that other products may not know about. So that's their sort of reasoning incentive in most cases for doing it. And in almost all cases, uh, reporting and coordination is directly handled with that company running the, the bounty and you're not talking to the, you know, the direct uh, software manufacturer or company that you found the issue in. So um, ZDI is probably one uh, that most people are aware of, or if you're getting in this space, uh, definitely look into. They were founded in 2005. This is their 10th year of doing that, so kudos to ZDI for, for really uh, being strong in this area. Um, and they focus, again, on, on, on software used by global enterprises, right? Um, the list of what they um, you know, will pay for, it's not published anywhere, so it's not super clear um, what you should research in many cases. But you can look at the upcoming advisories and get a feel for what they've done in the past and what's, what's coming up to sort of understand what platforms and types of, of bugs that they would, that they would pay for. A um, couple quick points for them. Uh, there's over 3,000 independent researchers that are registered with them. Uh, nearly 100 companies are represented. U.S., U.K., India, Germany, and France are the top five countries. Um, they didn't share with us the amount of unique researchers that have been paid. Um, but we, with working with them and seeing some other things, they have paid out um, 1,715 bounties. The average bounty, uh, again, they, they weren't willing to share, um, but ZDI has paid uh, bounty ranges from uh, three figures to six figures. So they have paid some serious money for vulnerabilities as well. And one of the things that they also do, um, they have sort of extra rewards and extra money if you're a repeat customer, right? If you're, if you're loyal to them and you're repeating things over and over, you can get cash bonuses, you can get uh, brought to conferences, you can get all those sorts of things, right? So uh, there are extra rewards if you, if you send a lot of, lot of things to them. All right, um, iDefense, uh, the VCP program, Karsten mentioned that as one of the first ones um, out there, right, 2002. We're not really sure if they exist anymore, to be quite frank. Um, there's been nothing uh, that's published since the October uh, 2013 timeframe, and most people that we've sort of talked to about if they're using them or not are starting to say that don't bother, don't waste your time. So uh, information about them is on their site. If you want to look into it, feel free, share with us if you get anywhere with them. Um, another one that we want to mention, uh, Exodus Intelligence, they were born out of the, the ZDI program 
And to be quite frank, not too much is known about this is this program yet as well. Um, you know, they came out and announced some things about the program, but we haven't seen a whole lot with it. Um, you know, they talk about targeting again, sort of critical. Um, uh, you know, vulnerabilities and issues and, and widespread software. Um, it's unknown the number of bounties they've done. They weren't willing to disclose that. It's unknown. They weren't willing to disclose the number of researchers that are participating. But if you look on their site about uh, what they're up to, they say they're going to intend to be competitive, and they also say there's yearly bonuses for the top four researchers of 20 grand each. So again, uh, it's unclear. We don't have any evidence of what's been going or what they've been doing, but it, um, something to look into if you're, if you're in this space as well. So contact them for details. So just some quick pointers if you want to try to coordinate with some of these third-party companies. And a lot of these pointers actually go for the company-run bounties as well. Um, first of all, make, make sure you're clear on what software they're likely to accept. Uh, and as Jake said, like look at, for instance, with CDI, look at what they publish, look at what they uh, have as upcoming to figure out. Um, when you report vulnerabilities to them also, make sure that when you report them as cases that create a case for each separate distinct vulnerability. So not attack vectors, but root causes. One of the reasons you want to do this is because when, if you send a case where you just kind of bundle everything in, there's a risk that they might not completely understand that you're reporting X amount of separate vulnerabilities. So the offers they'll give to you will be for one vulnerability, and then you'll have to start discussing with them that, hey, there are this many vulnerabilities, shouldn't it be a high amount? So if you create one per case, it'll make it easier for them, it'll make it easier for you, and it'll increase your chance of actually getting paid properly. Um, when it comes to writing up and providing information to them, make sure you include as many confirmed details as possible. Don't do any guesswork because that will just confuse them, especially if you're very wrong. Um, trim down PCs and exploits also to make it easy. The reason you want to provide all this information to them is, again, to help yourself. Because the more detailed information you provide to them, the clear, cleaner your POCs and or exploits are, the easier it is for them, once they start validating your findings, to quickly do it, and then you get paid quicker and also less confusion about it. Make sure to clearly list the software that you tested. And since they're confirming your findings, make sure you actually provide references, links, to where you obtained the trial software if you did, or where they can least find it. That will also save you time and make sure the whole process goes much, much smoother. So the next thing we want to talk about are the crowdsourced bounties. And when we talk about crowdsourced bounties, we're talking about all these portals we're seeing jump up, all these platforms that have all these researchers tied to them. And then the companies, instead of creating their own bounty program, they can come and use this portal and quickly set it up to their liking and get things done. So he, what happens is all these bounties will be open to researchers. Some of them will be open. Some of them will actually be private. But a lot of them will be open to you. And then the way it works is that you send your submissions through this portal and then it's being passed on to the companies that then will make sure to, to get stuff fixed. All the payment and all that stuff will happen through the portal also. So what we are seeing is this blur between the traditional bug bounties and pen testing. So Jake was talking earlier about being an independent pen tester and how you had to do all this work. Well, some of these uh, new platforms are actually making it a bit easier, at least cutting out the sales process because you can sign up for these programs or get inv invited to participate in them. Bug Crowd is one of the first ones we want to discuss. Uh, it was founded in 2012. Their targets are web, mobile, client-side, embedded applications, and the reason you also introduced Flex, which is a crowdsourced penetration test. Uh, currently, and that was when we wrote this, they had 23 uh, public and currently active programs. They uh, then had a number of private programs also that you had to be invited for. And they've had 170 programs that they have completed so far. Uh, and since October 2013, they've had around 57 companies participating. From a researcher perspective, they have over 10,000 researchers that have signed up for this service, so they definitely have the largest researcher base of varying quality from different countries. Uh, but if you look at the number of unique researchers that have actually been paid money, uh, it's only 230, uh, 31 uh, researchers. So there might be a lot of researchers, but we don't know how many are necessarily very active. The sign-up process is very easy. Basically, just go to the sign-up page, find a username, email address, password, boom, you're in, and you can start signing up to the different programs and start finding vulnerabilities and then report them. So it's an easy process. If we look at um, the number of bugs, then they have 
been handling a bit more than a thousand bucks since November 2012. The average bounty amount is around 250 US dollars. Uh, payouts are primarily through PayPal, but there have been made exceptions with Western Union and some other options. The average time to process a submission is between two to six weeks, uh, but generally it seems to go pretty fast. The largest single payout has been $13,500, so there's still some significant amounts also. And the locations with interest, we'll talk again a bit about locations. Again, most of the researchers here seem to be from India, Europe, and the eastern part of the uh, US. They also have this leaderboard where you can actually see who's doing the best at the moment, uh, where you can kind of see. They provide, again, there's these different options. You can get kudos points, you can get rewards. It's up to the different uh, companies that participate in this program what they want to provide. And here you can kind of see, and a lot, some people like all these kudos points, but again, that's also a lot of people that are unhappy about it. Again, as I said, if we want to do this professionally, we don't really care about the kudos, we care about the cash. So there are some people that are complaining that too many of the programs that are currently active uh, to actually not have monetary rewards. Uh, people are going after Barcraft for it, but really, end of day, they shouldn't really be faulted for it because they just provide the, the options and then it's up to the companies that use them to what they want to choose. So it's really the companies. And again, if you're a charity, then as a researcher, yeah, I might invest some of my time to find, find some vulnerabilities and do it for kudos. But if you're some security company that has just received a ton of VC money, for me as a researcher, it's fucking offensive. When the all you want to give me is a thank you for finding vulnerabilities in your site. <laughs> so the next one we want to talk about is uh, HackerOne. Uh, it was founded in 2013. Their targets are a bit different because they have different uh, response teams handling things. So it can really be focused on whatever these response teams want to get handled. Uh, currently 63 different uh, teams that run public programs on HackerOne, and then there's a lot of private programs that you have to be invited for. They say they have uh, thousands of researchers that are registered, and around 800 have submitted valid findings that either led to a bounty or some sort of recognition. So we don't have the exact number of people that have actually been paid, but 800 have either received recognition or, or, or money. Sign up here is also very easy. Name, username, password, boom, you're in, and you can actually start working immediately and finding stuff. They have paid more than uh, 1,300 bug bounties. The average bounty amount is almost $700. La uh, largest payout has been uh, $15,000. They've had multiple of those. Uh, one of them was the internet bug bounty that they're running. It was paid for Heartbleed, that we all know and heard about. Other ones were Yahoo. They've been paying out some 15,000 bug bounties also, so there's also some serious cash there. The internet bug bounty is one of the ones that's pretty interesting because they cover different technologies. Like, so if you find vulnerabilities in products like PHP, Perl, Django, you can actually report vulnerabilities. They also have an internet bounty where if you find vulnerabilities in other components that are considered critical to the internet, like for instance with Heartbleed, you can actually get paid as well. The minimum bounty here in this case is 5,000 US dollars. They also have a different version called the Sandbox Escape. If you find a vulnerability in like Chrome, all the browsers uh, like Internet Explorer or Adobe Reader, you find a sandbox escape, well, you can also actually get paid through this program. So you can actually report the vulnerability to Adobe, but at the same time, you can actually pass it on to these guys also. And again, the minimum payout is $5,000. Another one we want to discuss is CrowdCurity, also found in 2013. Their focus is on web applications and usually things that are Bitcoin related. Currently, they have 45 active bounties. They have run around 90 programs uh, all time, and companies in the 50 to 100 range have used the platform. They have 1,300 researchers signed up, and around 300, 400 of them are actually considered active. And the most predominant research, again, from India, Europe, and Malaysia, and US. And around 100 unique researchers have been paid so far. Signing up here is, again, also very easy, like the other programs. Quick details, you're in, and you can start immediately. They paid around 800 bucks. The average bug amount here is $150. They uh, do it a bit differently. They provide package options to the customers. 
and then they can decide what they want. So we're not seeing the same big ranges that we do for some of the other programs. Uh, the largest single payout has been $1,500 here. Crowdcurity is also doing the Hall of Fame stuff, um, but what we at least like about their approach is that they also show report quality. So you actually go in for researchers and you can see the report quality, so how good it is, not just the kudos points. The last one we want to discuss is a bit special. That's Synac. That was founded in 2013. It's actually not a managed bug bounty provider. As such, it's more focusing on application vulnerabilities across web, mobile, infrastructure. So it's really this sort of penetration test approach where as a researcher, you sign up, or it's not as easy, we'll cover that, and then you get paid per vulnerability you find. So instead of being paid for just doing an engagement, you get paid for actually showing results. Um, they didn't share a lot of details with us, so we don't know how many clients they have, we don't know how many researchers they have, we know that around 40% of them are US based though, the rest are international. As I said, the application process is challenging, it's invite only, so when you sign up you have to provide them a lot of information, you have to kind of make them understand why you deserve to be in this program, how many years of experience have you had, etc. Once you've filled out the, pro the process form, they'll actually schedule a call with you, like a 30 minute call where you can have to talk to them, explain your background so they can figure out whether you're a fit for this platform. So they do a lot of research of vetting compared to the other programs. Um, again, number of payouts, unknown, bounty amount, averages unknown. Uh, they have shared with us that the payout range is between 100 US dollars to 5,000. There's no upper limit, but that's the range of what you should expect to get paid per issue you find. So some point does when you report to these crowdsource programs, because it's actually a bit different. Because the risk of duplicates for these programs is much higher than for some of the other programs. So speed is a much, much bigger factor. If you sit down and take the third party program approach, for instance, where you sit down, you write up a very nice report, you want it all to be clear, you send it into them, you're like, I wrote this amazing report, and then, you know what, someone just beat you to it, because there's so many other people looking at it, and they'll only pay the first person that find it, so all you get out of it is kudos for all your hard work. So instead, what you should do in this case is, when you find a vulnerability, don't just like collect them and then report eventually, get them out immediately, quick POC, quick description, just send it out. Obviously you want some level of detail, but just something quick so you can make sure that you increase your chances of being the first one that actually gets the money. Um, what we really do like about many of these programs though, and encourage you to do is a lot of them provide a heads up on upcoming bounties, so they will say, oh, we have this new one that will launch. So you can actually sit and be ready for it. So as soon as that program goes live, you can be away hacking immediately. That allows you to quicker find some of the low-hanging fruit also, get it reported quickly and increase your chance of getting paid. Because if you get in late on those, and as again we've been talking about, we are talking about hundreds of active researchers on, on most of them, then a lot of people have already been looking at it, there's a good chance they find it. And when I was using some of these programs also, if you get in late just to find it, you might find a vulnerability, you go like, oh, that's good. You'll write it up, report, send it off quick. The thing is, someone already found it, it just hasn't been fixed yet. Waste of time, two kudos points, yay. So, Jake will now cover brokers. Are they a better approach? Is it a different category? Is it something you might want to do and look at instead? All right. Um, so, bug brokers, what are we talking about? Um, basically, researcher who finds a vulnerability works with a broker, and that broker will then find the best market and, and uh, the right amount, of, uh, the best price um, for that information, right? Um, and this could be a number of avenues, including gray and black markets. Um, and it's generally still thought of um, as the way to get the most amount of money possible for your, for your research. Um, in almost all cases, the reporting and the coordination is directly handled with the broker uh, who handles everything about that transaction and um, details of the vulnerability are typically never published, right? In a lot of the other areas, um, the terms and agreement may vary by program, but at some point you may get a little credit and, and go through the disclosure process. In this case, usually it's not discussed at all, as you can imagine. Um, so one of the uh, uh, places we looked at that does brokering is um, a company called Beyond Security has uh, a team they call Secure Team. They have the Secure Team Secure Disclosure, um, and it's not really a purchasing program, 
but if you have a vulnerability of interest that's critical or something that they, they care about, um, they'll look at it. Um, they weren't willing to share a lot of information with us, as you can imagine, so we don't know the number of researchers. Uh, we don't know how many unique ones have been paid, uh, but, but we were able to find from them that they have researchers in all continents, um, except for Africa, and uh, most of them are the U.S. and Europe. Now here's where it gets interesting. Um, they shared uh, with us that over 100 bounties were paid last year. If you look at the average amount, they're saying that the bounties were between five and 100,000, and they shared with us and claimed that the largest single payout that they had was over $1 million. So you're talking about some serious money. Now when we've shared this with several people, we've had a lot of people say, bullshit, we don't believe it. So there is that, but from working with them, you know, they're, they're claiming that this is legit, that they have had you know, over a million dollar uh, payout. Um, a little bit of a different uh, approach um, because, again, you know, it still does take time to, to report uh, issues and, and disclosure process. Uh, Sakunya had uh, created a program to coordinate um, quite some time ago. It was in the end of, of 2011. Uh, they weren't actually willing to really pay you anything, but they would you know, get you to a conference and that sort of thing. But it was really just an offer to help uh, get things fixed and, and be that broker for you. Um, but what's interesting is... Uh, this, this service is closed for business, so rest in peace August 2013, um, and really what came out of it, which just again shows that there's a lot of work when it goes into the disclosure process, is that they ended it basically saying the amount of time and effort just wasn't worth it to the organization, right? So this is now uh, no longer an option. And you really, you just can't talk about uh, uh, brokering without this guy. Does everyone know who this guy is? The Grunk, right? So um, he's got a lot to say on this topic. If you're interested, if you want to hear his thoughts, he's, he's talked a lot about it, contacted him. I'm sure he'd be willing to share more and talk to you about uh, information. So we quickly want to discuss bug bounties. Is it worth your time and some of the considerations you should make? Um, you want to do a reality check before starting out. Uh, when I eventually left Sukunia, I was, and actually a couple of years before I left, I was toying with the idea of going full-time bug bounty hunter. And actually wanted to do it and move myself and my family to Thailand and do it from down there. And I'll cover a bit later why that was part of the consideration. Um, but before kind of doing all this, you want to do, as I said, the reality check. Ask yourself a couple of questions. Um, the first one, how much money would I need per month to stay afloat? Uh, if you have a house, a mortgage, a car, a wife and a kid to take care of in Denmark, your expenses will be a lot higher than if you're single in Thailand, depending on how you spend your free time down there. <laughs> the reason I mentioned Denmark versus Thailand is because location actually matters. Um, these, these are some quick stats from, most of them are from sourced from a, a website called Payscale that shows average salaries a year for pen testers, and it covers everything from like the new junior guy that just started to the very senior guy. So obviously if you're in the former category, you'll be earning less than these amounts. If you're in the latter category, you might earn twice as much. But the point is more that salary is also followed by expenses. So if I'm sitting in Thailand and the average salary down there is, let's say, 15,000, 10, 15,000 US dollars a year, I don't have to find a lot of vulnerabilities to make that happen quite quick. Yeah? If I'm sitting in Denmark and the average salary is 100K, it takes a lot more effort. So this is part of the th thought process also of does it make sense financially for me to, to start doing this. Um, if you're in a lower income country, you'll have lower expenses. Uh, stay away from Iran though and some of those countries because if they're embargoed, a lot of these programs actually won't pay you. So you move down there for no reason. Um, so then we kind of have the idea, okay, now we know how much money do I need to stay afloat, have a comfortable life. Because obviously we want to do this to have a comfortable life, else it's no fun. So the next question you want to then ask yourself is, okay, what is the combination of products, vulnerability types, and numbers that I look at to make it happen? And this is where we talk skill set also, right? I mean, if you're a hardcore reverser and you can make badass exploits, well, then you will usually be in a category where you can find vulnerabilities that can be sold for more. And then you might find it easier to hit these numbers that you have for yourself. If you have a skill set that's restricted to finding cross-site scripting in websites, 
well, then you need to find more vulnerabilities. But what we like about bug bounties is the fact that there are options for everyone. It just depends then of how many vulnerabilities you have to find to hit these targets. Um, we see some researchers that find a few vulnerabilities in some high profile products, get paid a ton of money, like opponent to own competition we talked about. But we also see other researchers that kind of focus on other programs. Uh, a guy that's worth mentioning is Argot. He's been using CDI for like four years or so, and in that time he's found like 200 vulnerabilities. And then you can kind of do the math there that he's been making a good living off that, and he's been st sticking to not call it lower hanging fruit, but he's been keeping clear of all the big, uh, like he's not found vulnerabilities in Internet Explorer, but he's keeping it to HP products and some other IBM products that not many people are looking at and doing it very successfully. Part of this process is also, again, figuring out the numbers, also figuring out, well, <laughs> How much will I get paid, right? So kind of make a plan there. Uh, if you decide, okay, I'm going to hit these numbers, I'm going to hit Yahoo hard, find a lot of vulnerabilities, you report a lot of cross-site scripting vulnerabilities to them, and then they say, thank you, here's a $12.50 voucher for your trouble. This happened. I see some of you laughing, so you know, yeah. This actually happened for a security company they wanted to test it. So, and this is also why Yahoo actually changed the policy. So now if you report some awesome vulnerabilities to them, you can get up to 15K, right? So now it's interesting, but that's another one of the offensive ones. So now we know how much money do I need, and we also know like how do we want to make this happen. So then your last conclusion is, well, how much time will I need to invest in this? Um, one of the great things about being a professional bug bounty hunter is, of course, the freedom that's involved. So again, if you're living somewhere where you only have to find very little, like a small number of vulnerabilities to make it happen, great. Maybe you spend a few hours a day uh, day, a week or so, and you can actually make these numbers, right? But if you have to find a ton of vulnerabilities to make this happen, you're living in a high-income country with a lot of expenses, if you have to work 60 plus hours a week, well, suddenly it's not very fun, is it? And then you might want to ask yourself, well, is it worth it? And it, of course, if you have to spend that much time to make it happen, you're also increasing the risk of this not working out for you. So again, those are like the three good questions. And what are the questions I was asking myself when I was considering this? So... All these questions then, as I said, let you conclude. Bug bounty hunting, is that the career path for me or should I keep it as a hobby on the side? So, but again, the most important part is like if you don't form some sort of plan from the beginning, you figure out how you want to hit these numbers, what you're going to focus on, there's a very small chance that it'll work out for you in the long run, right? So again, if you have to generate $1,000 a month and you're living in India, Thailand, great. I mean, that's pretty easy. If you have to generate 10,000 a month, it gets harder. So, Jake will then finish off by discussing bug bounties and what we think is, uh, is to come. All right, a little pressed on time because there's a lot of content that we want to cover. So we're going to go over a few of these things. The good news for anyone that is a bug bounty hunter or wants to be is software is still complete shit right now. And so there's lots of things to find, right? And so if you look at these numbers from the OSBDB project where we track vulnerabilities, we're seeing 10,000 vulns a year. It doesn't seem to be slowing down. This also does not include any of the site-specific vulnerabilities and websites, right? So you're talking about a lot of options uh, out there. Um, we think that the rules and requirements are going to start to be enhanced a bit more, specifically when um, you know people are going after uh, cloud services, right? You start trying to do you know allegedly good bounty hunting on a, a, a software as a service, and you wipe it out. The company's not going to be real happy about that, right? So be real careful that we think there's going to be more and more clarity that comes in that in that space. Uh, legal threats, right? They still happen. For, for those in the room that have been around for a while know this, you think back to you know, 2005, the Cisco versus Mike Lynn, and most people say, oh yeah, we remember that, but things have gotten so much better. And in many ways they have, right? Um, but you know, legal threats are still happening and they are still successful. So you still want to just keep it in mind with what you're up to and be smart. Um, specifically, um, there's a big difference between a bug bounty and this thing called extortion, right? You want to be very careful. And so, for example, he's, this guy, Probable Onion on Twitter, he had a great thing. He, he contacts these guys saying, you have 12 hours to fix a vulnerability in your system. Otherwise, I will take, take control. You've been warned, right? And then all of a sudden, the, the company comes back and say, we'd, happy to, we'd be happy to do a bug bounty on this. Well, you know, what the heck are you talking about there? Um, not really what the bug bounty program set up for, right? And of course, you, you would say this guy would probably come back and, yeah, he's interested in the money. Okay, let's talk, right? 
So you want to be careful about that because if you think about it, um, we find out that a teen was arrested, right? And <laughs> this guy was a teen from Canada was arrested for doing things like this and swatting people like Krebs and all kinds of other things, right? So just, let, you know, the bounty stuff and vendors are now willing to, to work with you and, and pay money, but let's not get into this. Be very careful about this whole extortion area, right? Um, from a researcher's standpoint, um, you know, it's great now that companies are willing to, to pay, pay money, right? So we want to let researchers know this should be something that we should be appreciating that the fact that they're willing to pay and not the sort of the sense of entitlement. So many people will just go out there and pick a random website and start messing around with it and then demand payment when that company never asked you to do that. It's uncommissioned work, right? So definitely there's a lot of companies out there, there's a lot of ways as we described that are willing that have said they'll pay. You know, stick with those. You don't need to go out there. We do have uh, Google again. Now they've launched this new thing called Project Zero, if you've heard about it. Um, basically creating a dream team of researchers to weed out bugs in popular software. Um, we believe at this point it might not have uh, issues on websites, but on other software bits, we think it's going gonna, it's gonna to make it a lot harder and raise, raise the bar for it. Um, and we're already seeing people trying to calculate the ROI and what's going on in that, in that space of what's worth it. Um, so wrapping it up here, more and more companies are going to jump on board with, with uh, bug bounties pro programs. We ultimately think that kudos and karma, uh, karma stuff is nice, but it's going to lose out to where the biggest amount of money is. Um, and we believe that while companies are going to continue to have bug bounty programs as part of their security programs, that they're going to realize that eradicating vulns earlier in the SDL process still is a cheaper, better way. So we're going to see some shifting. So. With that, this presentation would not have been possible with a lot of people. We want to thank Brian Martin, Katie from HackerOne, Nate from Facebook, HPZDI, CrowdCurity, Secure Team, Marissa and Casey from Bug Crowd, and all the bug bounty hunters out there. Um, and the future bug bounty hunters, thank you. Thank you.